is coming. The king approacheth! The king approacheth! May I have your attention, please? Palm Sunday. Hosanna on high. My name is Amanda, and this is Brian, and uh, we're out here in downtown Rochester, and we're out asking people on the streets if they've ever heard of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday's a coming. What they know about it, and what's it mean to them? So, here we go. Palm Sunday is coming. Hosanna, may I have your attention, please? The king is coming. You there. In the Mercury. The king is coming. Hosanna. Pay attention to me. I mean, a Buick. Palm Sunday is uh, the last day of Lent. And, uh, uh, it's, the, it's, uh, it's when uh, Jesus, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Son of Jesus. Palm Sunday approaches. It happens on the Sunday after Easter. Is Easter a Sunday? Wasn't that when Jesus got uh, beaten with all the palms? He rode through Jerusalem and uh, they laid down palms in front of him. <laughs> the king is coming. The king is coming. Jesus came into Jerusalem and the people waved palms and laid them down. First learned that in Sunday school. Palm Sunday is nigh. Have you ever heard of Palm Sunday before? No, what's going on? The king approaches. Went to church and got palms in church. Why? Because I was Catholic. We would go to mass and everyone would receive a palm and it was symbolic of something. I'm so terrible, not even gonna lie. I just remember going to church on Palm Sunday and then going to church on Easter Sunday and getting the palms at church. Does that have any significance for you? Honestly, no. No, it does not. Just, just something you do. Absolutely, absolutely. Everyone, are you here? Palm Sunday is coming. Don't look at me like that. What did he ride in on? A donkey. Maybe a camel? A camel. A donkey? I don't remember what the significance of the donkey was. He wanted to show that even a king could ride on a donkey and not a horse. <laughs> I don't know why he rode on a donkey. Hosanna. You never heard of Hosanna? No. Well, he's coming. Palm Sunday is coming. Come on, folks. Don't run over me. Don't run over me. Wow. That is classic Kensington, isn't it? As those of you who have been here for a while know. And if you are new or newer here or you're just checking this place out on stream, welcome. You need to know we can be kind of goofy at times around here, but often insightful too. Isn't it interesting? People are trying to answer the question based on what they remember, what they read, what they've heard from others. And the reason we showed that video is that we are kicking off what Bible scholars call Holy Week today. Uh, it's a time where we, we walk through the last few days of Jesus's life. And our lead pastor, Danny Cox, is gonna come up in a little bit and talk us through Palm Sunday. Although you probably know most everything right now, but he's gonna add a little bit more to it. And then I want to invite you to come back on Friday. We'll have three services as we celebrate Good Friday, which is an event that changed history forever. And if you've ever asked this question, God, do you love me? Not God, do you love the world? I know you love the world, but do you love me? I really encourage you come back on Friday because you will have an answer to that question. And you'll leave here knowing just how much he loves you. And then on Saturday and Sunday, next weekend, we will celebrate Easter. It'll be a great celebration and a time of hope. You'll need to get tickets for this event because uh, of the number of people that will be coming. So go online, you can download them to your phone or print them out, bring them. And when you come next Saturday and Sunday, bring someone with you because we all know someone in our lives who need hope, right? That neighbor, that friend, that coworker, that sports buddy. And it'll be a service, of, it'll be a great celebration. When they leave, they'll have a sense of a life that's bigger for themselves as a result of what we celebrate. So that's next week and look forward to seeing you here for that. Ushers have invite cards on the way out. Your programs have uh, tear-offs. Please use those this week and make sure you bring someone in with you. 
And then I want to just speak to the women in the room for a minute. So guys, go ahead, drink your coffee, eat your donut, check in on the masters. Women, next month we are going to be retreating. Uh, we do this annually. We go up to Spring Hill Camp for our annual smash retreat. It's a chance to go off and leave work, leave kids, and meet Jesus in the woods. There's going to be some great singing. There will be large group messages, small group breakouts, and there will also be zip lining and kayaking and reading a book in the woods if that's what you want to do. I will be there. I'm looking forward to it. The theme this year is placed, and we're going to look at four women in the Bible and how God has uniquely gifted them and placed them into a place of influence. And then we're gonna talk about how that applies to our lives. So you can go out to the lobby. We have some women out there who will answer your questions. There's some cards out there, or you can go online and sign up. I hope you will join me. I'm looking forward to that next month. Today, as we uh, enter into this Palm Sunday, we're gonna try to answer the question, could it be him? Could it be him? And so uh, that's the question we're gonna tackle. But first, let's stand up, greet a few people around you and then we'll dive in. So simple, stirring the crowd. Who is this? Whose nature is humble, nothing to proud. We've been waiting for the king. How could this man? welcome. We really wanted to start and set the table with a different feeling. And I don't know if you felt this, but for me, I felt it every time. Boy, Cameron's voice, are you kidding me? You know what it feels like to me? Yeah. And here's why I say this. I, 
of course I'm celebrating his talent, but more than that, I'm celebrating his heart because it feels to me of the longing and the cry of a human heart, the way he comes at that song. And I believe that's what it felt like on the original Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday represents when Jesus enters into the city, this triumphal entry, this king entering in and people seeing and hoping with all their heart, the longings of their heart, that he would be exactly who he said he was. I believe even to this day, that this Palm Sunday, we feel the same thing. We have this pull and this longing in our heart and our hope that Jesus is who he said he is. And this week, this Easter week, starting right now, is a journey. It's a journey from Palm Sunday to Good Friday where Jesus gave all, everything, his whole life on the cross for all people. And then Easter where he overcomes death. And we're taking this journey and I invite you to take it with us. We're asking three questions. The first one is, could it be him? Second one is this, could it be over Good Friday? And then Easter, could it be true? And here's what I would say to you today. If it's true that Jesus is who he says he is, game changer. It's over, it's a different game. And I really believe he is. And we're gonna look at this story as he's entering into a city, I would say this today, I hope he enters into our hearts because I think that's a big metaphor. Him entering into the city is him entering into the human heart. And when Jesus enters into something, it changes. He brings a profound eternal hope that is only rooted in Jesus. You know, this past Wednesday, we did a service here. We have services here every second and fourth Wednesday at seven o'clock. I invite you to come back for those. But in the last few weeks, Andrew Kim and the team designed a service that we're looking at some of Jesus's last kind of moments leading to the cross. And because we're in the season of Lent, we looked at what did Jesus give up And then what did he take up because he gave those up? And this past Wednesday, uh, we talked about one word. And and honestly, they're illustrated in these beautiful paintings. We use these paintings in January. It's a local artist. I think she did all of these paintings in four days. They're really amazing. And they mean a lot to me personally. They move me every time I look at them because I believe that they express the heart of Jesus, a, a different kind of king bringing a different kind of kingdom. So imagine this, that you are the creator of the universe, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the one that's all powerful. If you were gonna enter in next to your creation, how would you do it? You would have all options. If it was me, I would enter in with all my power displayed. But Jesus enters in in a manger as a tiny baby, vulnerable, reliant on his human parents to raise him. That's how the King came the powerful coming powerless, the image of the lamb, the spotless, beautiful, perfect, innocent lamb, Jesus coming to be a sacrifice for all people that he would give his life up, the final sacrifice and anyone that would place their faith in him would never perish, but have everlasting life. The lamb, gentle, beautiful, perfect, spotless, the towel and basin, Jesus as a rabbi, in those times, rabbi had a lot of power and a lot of status and a lot of privilege. And here he's with his disciples towards the very end of his life. And you know what he does? He takes off his outer cloak and then he gets down and he washes his disciples' dirty, ugly feet. Guess what? I have a hard time doing that with my own kids. But the creator of the universe does it to his followers. You know what he did? He laid it down. What did he lay down? He laid down his power so that all people would have access to the ultimate power. And then of course the donkey. We're gonna look at that today. This animal that's not an animal of war and power, but one of gentleness, meekness, and peace. And so this past Wednesday, we talked about that. We opened up, I had them leave these pictures here for you this weekend because I believe it plays beautifully into this week, this Easter week. So they have a vision of a different kind of king bringing a different kind of kingdom, bringing a different kind of hope. And the people in the first Palm Sunday needed hope. They had a lot of burdens on their shoulders. I know many of you today 
In fact, I know you, I know many of you, I know your circumstances. You, on streaming in this room, you, you have burden. This past Wednesday, we also did something, just look over there, it says, bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6.2. It's a beautiful image of how God's community of hope should be actually holding up all of our burdens together. And so at the end, when we realize that Jesus is all power, but he's giving us power and his hope, we just, I just ask the community, would you just go to the wall and would you write down your burdens? It, to, look, I'm gonna challenge you. If you don't wanna write something down today, that's fine when you, when, you, when you leave, but I would challenge you, would you just read it? <laughs> because man, I'm telling you, when you read that wall, you see the heart of a community that needs and longs for hope. That was Palm Sunday, a cry for hope, a longing for hope. And here's Jesus entering in in a very unique way and saying, I am. Maybe not how you expect it, but I embody all hope, all power, all justice, and here I come. I want you to know something. To this day, Jesus is all
Lord, that's what we pray today. We, Lord, we pray that there is a movement of hope, a movement of Jesus in our midst. Lord, we really do pray for that. And, we, and Father, we're all coming from different places. There are some in here that they hear those words and, man, they're just like, I, I don't know. Some hear those words and the longing of their heart says, I hope that's true. And there are some people in the midst that hear those words and say, yeah, that's true. Lord, wherever we are in our journey, would you guide us into true life, hope, peace, grace, mercy, rooted in Jesus. And we all say, amen. Well, welcome. We are so uh, grateful that you're here. I'm grateful that that you're with us on this Palm Sunday. I don't know how many of you have uh, memories, childhood memories of Palm Sunday uh, in the particular tradition that I came from. I have a lot of memories. And we go to church on Palm Sunday and we sit in the pews with my parents and we get these palms, you know, and and most of the time, my two brothers and I, to be honest with you, they would become swords, you know, we'd start beating each other. My dad would have to stop us or I was a drummer, so I'd play drums, you know, air drums with them and I always get in trouble. And, uh, but it was a little sacrilegious, but we did it anyway. And, but the one memory that I really have is every Palm Sunday, my parents would come home and they have this, they still have it to this day, this crucifixion, this beautiful crucifixion. They would come home in their bedroom, they would go and they would wrap these palms around the crucifix and they would keep them there all year and then they would replace them the next Palm Sunday. And so every time you walked into their room, I could have this image, this beautiful image of palms wrapped around this crucifix. Now, I didn't realize the weight of that image. You know, here I am playing drums with these palms, right? I don't understand that. But as you get older and you really start to understand the significance of it, it just has a beautiful, beautiful power to it. Jesus was a controversial figure in his time and in our time as well. There have been a lot of mixed reviews in his time and here in this time about who he was, about who he claimed to be, about what his faithful followers witnessed and witnessed firsthand about the amazing miracles and the works that he did. I'm telling you, it's the same today. People are still questioning the claims of Jesus. And the biggest question that people had on their minds, the original Palm Sunday, I think is the same today. Is Jesus who he claimed to be? Is he who he claimed to be? Is he the son of God? Is he the Messiah, the savior, the creator of the universe, the Lord of Lords, the lover of your soul, the one who is the image of the invisible God, God himself in flesh, living among his people, the creator dwelling with the created. That's what Jesus said he was. Is he? Those are big claims. And for centuries, theologians and philosophers and thinkers and preachers and teachers, they've argued this point. They've written about it. They've spoken about it. In 1936, Watchman Nee, who's a great writer and philosopher, he wrote something in a similar fashion to a preacher from the 1700s. He says this, if Jesus claims to be God, yet in fact he is not, He has to be a madman or a lunatic. If someone says that they're one thing and they're not, he has to be a madman or a lunatic. Now, several years later, really another well-known writer and philosopher, C.S. Lewis, he penned probably the most famous version of this idea in his book, Mere Christianity. He says it this way. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the real foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or a liar. He must, you must make your own choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Whew, man, what a, come on. That is a challenge. And Jesus said a lot of, very bold statements about himself. And either you believe or you don't. 
but there's not this in-between moment. That is a challenge. Those are strong words. And the crowd witnessing the first Palm Sunday, I think we're wrestling with these same questions. And we're going to look through the lens of a few different kinds of people in the, at the first Palm Sunday. Now, maybe they're in this room right now. People who mocked, people who hoped, and people who believed. We're going to look through three lenses. So let's look at a passage found in the Gospel of John. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are these eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life written out for us to really go through and hear his heart, know his ministry. And at this point in the Gospel of John, who happened to be my favorite gospel, I love John. He's a little arrogant when he thinks he's the most beloved one of all, but I do love him. He's got an artist's heart. He's amazing. And this particular moment happens at the festival of Passover. Passover is this massive feast at this point in this massive festival, uh, celebrating God and his faithfulness of rescuing his people out of uh, slavery and move them into uh, promises. And then this crowd was all gathered to do this feast. The crowd was massive picture New Year's Eve, you know, Times Square, probably Times 10, I don't know. Tons of people there. Some historians estimate that there's over 200 million people there, over a quarter million sacrifices. It was this unbelievable energy. The city was packed with worshipers. The energy was off the charts, and then word comes that Jesus is entering into this city. Now, it's a rare thing that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels, actually record the same event. But this is one of those moments. That means that this event was a big deal. John 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him. So here's where you see the palm branches. The palm branches in this time, in these ancient times, were symbolizing victory and triumph and goodness. Some people have said in other accounts that they would take off their cloak and they would lay them down on the road. That they lay palm branches down on the road. This act of submission, this act of honoring God. Saying, this is who you are. This is who we hope you are. Raving these palm branches an absolute victory. Now, I remember years ago, Steve Norman, who's a great friend, a great leader in our church, uh, he said that palm branches back in the first century were like the first century foam finger. You know, they were just like, yes! You know, it's, it's sort of like the final four, Michigan State. Final, well, so is it too early? Sorry. Uh, you know, you're like, don't bring that up, please. But it is that moment of anticipation and celebration, anticipating victory and screaming out. There's this unbelievable energy and the crowd is singing, Hosanna, this high praise. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Now, despite what Jesus had told about his actual mission and he told people about why he was there, all the people there really were looking for a different kind of leader. They were looking for a different kind of king. They were really hoping that this was going to be a military leader that was going to come in and rescue them from the oppressive powers of the Roman rule. So they want this military leader to come in. He's going to ride in and he's going to make everything right right now. They had incredible expectations on Jesus and they were singing Hosanna. Hosanna is this phrase of praise, but it's also rooted in the idea of expectation. So they're, they're singing, saying, you are going to be the one that delivers us. You're Hosanna, the praise of expectation. You could just sense that there was this unbelievable sense of just shaking and waiting. This is the moment they've been hearing about for hundreds of years. You know, every day of my life, I experience a small little bit of this because we own a 100-pound Newfoundland dog. And I'm telling you, when 100 pounds, when you walk through that door and 100 pounds starts running at you full force, you're like, oh, Lord, you know. And, and here's what I know about, about Juliet. It doesn't matter where she's in in the house. If I just shake her leash a little bit, she'll come running that 100 pounds and stop her. And then she'll be just like, I'm going on a walk. Right? And then I don't take her, poor girl. But... It's just to get her in the house. You know, I trick her. Uh, I'm bad. But the expectation that she has, I can imagine just hundreds of thousands of people just shaking like, this is the Messiah. This is what we were waiting for. And then Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. That is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt. 
This was a prophecy that happened almost 500 years before through Zechariah saying, this is going to happen. This is the moment. And so they have this in their minds. And it's beautiful to me, the, sim- the symbolism of a donkey. That's why I love that painting. So I love these paintings. So it starts to show the heart of a different kind of king building a different kind of kingdom. Jesus making the intentional choice to ride in on a donkey, fulfilling these prophecies, is saying that I'm coming in differently on a different kind of vehicle. The horse at those times would have been a a symbolism of power in war, but the donkey wasn't that. The donkey was this kind of lowly, humble, meek animal. In, In some Eastern traditions, they would think it would be a symbol of peace. And so here you have the power of the Roman culture that is a war horse culture. And here all this time, a different kind of king enters in. Scripture calls Jesus the Prince of Peace. He enters in on a symbolism of peace. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Lazarus was a good friend of his and just before this moment, he actually went to Martha and Mary and Lazarus. Lazarus had passed away and Jesus resurrected him from, from death, really pointing to his own death and resurrection. Many people witnessed this and because they had heard of this incredible sign, they went out to meet Jesus. So the Pharisees who are the religious people at the time They said to one another this, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now the religious people are getting worried. Now all of a sudden there's a different kind of movement happening. And who was in the crowd that day witnessing Jesus entering into the city? Telling you that movement of entering into the city is a movement of entering into hearts. Who is there? We're gonna look through the eyes maybe of the Roman soldiers. We're gonna call those, those who mock. Verse 12, the next day the great crowd had come. We know that when there were great crowds in that time, the Roman emperor and the Roman rule would put their soldiers out there and make sure that there wasn't any rioting. And we knew that that was there at that point. They didn't want any kind of uprising. They want any kind of conflict. So they would contain those things. In fact, I listened to a historian talk not too long ago. And he opened my eyes to something that was interesting. He said, in that particular culture and under Roman rule, they didn't care what kind of religion you studied. It was very much a pluralistic society. So you could study whatever you want. So they weren't worried about what Jesus was teaching so much as what was happening about the uprising around Jesus. And so here the Romans are there, they're seeing this kind of uprising, they're hearing the hosannas being sung out, they're hearing that here it is the deliverer and they could see that they would come around this and contain this potential riot, this potential uprising. And then in that moment, all of a sudden they look and what do they see? They see a king that's riding in on a donkey. And I can't imagine that they were like, oh, please, this? This is what you're all excited about? You have no idea how we do it here in Rome. Because in Rome, when they had victories and they had the triumphal entry, it was a whole different set of rules. They'd ride in on these massive chariots, sometimes laced in gold. They would have some of their actual war tools on the side of these big wheels. They'd have these powerful horses. Many times, last night, my, my wife's hilarious. She's, she's awesome and she loves history and she reads about so many things. And last night she was listening to me. She was like, you didn't mention one of the things that you need to do. When we drive home, I'm gonna teach you about that whole Roman thing. And so she did. And, but, but she did mention the idea that in those moments, these great processions and they would have almost like a ticker tape parade and all their power displayed. Many times they would have prisoners that they had captured in cages and they'd be dragging them behind. They say, look at this. This is the power that we have. So you can imagine the Roman soldiers are, this is what everyone's excited about? Please. They have no idea what power is. This, this is your savior. This is your Jesus. But Jesus is a different kind of king. And he came to build a different kind of kingdom. In fact, scripture says, when he's pushed hard on and he says, yeah, I'm a king, but my kingdom's not of this world. It's a different kind of kingdom. It's been fascinating for me in my life. Years ago, uh, my first 20, 25 years of my career was as a musician and artist. I played a lot in this town, but a lot everywhere else. And when when I came to Jesus in my 
early 30s uh, here underneath this exit sign. I had a profound change in my life. And as I went through it, I started to play more here than I was playing out in the community. And there was kind of a rumble out there because I was connected with a lot of people. And they'd say, where's Danny? And I would hear stuff people would say, they're like, ah, he's one of those Jesus freaks now. I don't know, he's, he, he's part of some weird church, which is true, we are weird. But <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna argue that fact. If you've been here long enough, you know we do Palm Sunday weird videos. But we are, you know, a strange, beautiful community. But I'm like, but, but they were always rolling their eyes. I would hear stuff like, yeah, I don't know. The guy's gone off the deep end. I don't know what his problem is. You know, I have family members to this day that do that to me. We'll be at gatherings and all of a sudden I'll say something or we'll pray or do something. And I remember one time recently, not that long ago, someone asked, hey, what is that? Can you explain that? I started explaining it. <laughs> My family's hitting me and go, don't listen to that. It's all garbage. It's all made up. It doesn't mean anything. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Remember years ago, uh, when I studied atheism in my late teens, early 20s, I had a really good friend of mine. We studied Ayn Rand and objectivism and all this kind of stuff. And I loved it. I read a lot about it. I was part of all that. And, and uh, my friend, who was, was so close with, he was just adamant about this. And then a few years later, when I had my experience with Jesus, I was so nervous to go to him and tell him about this. But he was one of the musicians that kind of heard about it. So I remember getting in front of him for the first time. And he's like, hey, I heard something. I heard you're actually following Jesus. Is that true? What is wrong with you? You can't do that. I was like, I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, I'm over there and then I hear something and something changes in my heart and all of a sudden something came in. It's kind of mysterious, but there's hope there and it wasn't hope before. And I was like, ah, you know, <laughs> guess what? Years later, he's following Jesus. So ka you know, like <laughs> I win. Actually, I don't win. I have nothing to do with it. But you're like, oh, that's great. Yeah. I didn't do anything, actually. That has nothing to do with me. But it's amazing to me. At the name of Jesus, many times there's a lot of eye rolling. Uh, okay. Yeah. I think on the first Palm Sunday, same thing. That? Uh, those who mock. Second one is this, those who hope. Before this moment on Palm Sunday, Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the death. And there was a whole community that witnessed this. And now his fame is bubbling up and gaining attention. And people were starting to come from all over, not only to catch a glimpse of Jesus, but they want to see Lazarus. I heard someone was raised from the dead. I want to see that. I want to see that so that I can see Jesus. John 12, when all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus raised from the dead. Jesus' fame is growing so much that it was said that the lead priests at that time were actually plotting not only to kill Jesus, but they were planning to kill Lazarus, that they wanted to squash this movement as quickly as possible. John 12, 17, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word about Jesus. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. People were showing up to see Lazarus and the change in Lazarus to actually believe in Jesus. Now, I want you to know something today. You realize that still happens. I'm watching people in our community and I'm one of them that I was dead in my spiritual life and I was brought to life with Jesus. We see that all in this community. We see it around the country and the world. When Jesus enters into a city, when Jesus enters into a heart, something changes. Death becomes life. Despair becomes hope. On my first trip to Nepal, we have a ministry in Nepal where uh, Ramesh Sapkota and his team actually rescue young women, vulnerable women that have been trafficked into India and different parts of the world. They rescue them, they bring them to a safe house, they restore them in the name of Jesus. They introduce them many times to Jesus because in that culture, they've never heard of Jesus. And when Jesus takes root in their life and they've been rescued physically and then rescued spiritually by Jesus, something happens. So the first trip I was ever there, I met a young woman named Jyoti and she had been through this process and now dressed in a purple, beautiful robe, she, they send her back into her village to tell people about Jesus. Same thing that's happening a lot of times right here. And you know what happened? It was really incredible. We get to this village and all of a sudden they hear that Jyoti and her team is coming and we look down the field, these fields and I'm not kidding you, just hundreds of people were coming out of everywhere. Why are they coming there? They wanna see, they wanna see this vulnerable young woman 
and they wanna hear about the hope she found that they don't understand. They wanna see this dead thing that was lost that has been found and brought to life. They wanna hear that and they wanna see it because they wanna believe in this too. They have hope that there's something more. And when, I'll tell you what, man, when she preached in this little hut, I was like, I believe. We see it all the time. So it's happening in these moments and we're seeing hope restored. Yesterday, we had a small group of us uh, here, about 25, 30 people that went through suicide alert training. You know, that's an issue in this culture. That's an issue in our city. That's been an issue in our congregation. And I have a passion for that. So does Nancy Warman and a number of others that we wanna step into this and we wanna bring hope in. So we have a friend of ours, Karen Marshall, who is an expert in this, sits right in the seat. She was here last service. She's been doing this for 27 years and she's starting a training. We're gonna do something on May 5th for all of you. We're gonna invite people to come and be part of it. So keep your eyes out for that. But we were in this training and she said something so powerful to me. She said, listen, you, she said, people that are in this situation, all the way to the very end, they hold on to hope. And you, your community can be the community of hope that pulls them back into reality. And then she started to train us through other stuff. It's just extraordinary. And she told us a story about the Golden Gate Bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge is one of the most famous places for people to take their life. And she told us a story about a per- certain person that she's toured with around the country and the world. The guy's name's Kevin Hines, I think. And he survived the jump. And there's only been about 20, 25 people or something. You can look that up. I don't remember the number, but it's not been very many people that have survived this. And, and so he survived it. And, and every one of those people pretty much said the same thing. The minute they made the decision, they said, oh no, what did I do? You know why? Because there is a part of eternity and hope that lives in us to the very last moment. I believe that hope is rooted in the person of Jesus because he placed eternity in the heart of every single man and woman, boy and girl. That we can be a community of hope. By the way, I'm gonna say this as a side note. If you're at that place in your life where you feel despair and hopelessness today, tell someone, please. Please tell someone. Make me, make me that promise and make God that promise right now. Tell someone. But we can be rooted in God's hope. We can be a community in God's hope. When I look at that wall of the burdens of our people, yes, there are burdens on that wall, but I actually look at that wall and say, but there's hope. There are hope on that wall because Jesus, when he enters into our burdens, he actually brings a hope that is rooted not just in this world, but in eternity. Those who hope, those who mock, those who hope, and then finally the last one is this, those who believe. Those who believe. I'm gonna give you a couple of thoughts and a story about that uh, in a moment. We're gonna receive our offering right now. So if you come prepared to give, thank you. I know many of us, uh, this is our moment of worship. You know, with this, our moment saying, Lord, thank you. We're part of this community. We're part of the vision of creating a hope community around the world rooted in Jesus. So we give back. Um, many of you give as Amy and I give. In fact, I think 80% now give online. That's what we do as well. And so thank you for that. If you're brand new here, this does not have to be your moment at all. Uh, we're just grateful that you're here. Your moment actually is when you walk out those doors into the lobby, there's a place called The Hub. It has everything about who we are. We'd love you to meet some people out there, tell the story. Uh, how you're connected to this place. Just so you know, there are a number of different ways uh, to give. We can give right now in the pouches. We can also give online and give on our app, which you can download on your phone, probably the easiest way. And then also 77977 to Kensington. But thank you, all of you uh, that do that and keep this mission moving in the name of Christ. So thanks. Those who mock, those who hope. And then the last one, those who believe. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival that came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. They said, sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip then in turn told Jesus. People came to actually see Jesus and worship Jesus. People came of all sorts that believed exactly who Jesus said he was, that were touched by Jesus in some way and saw this unbelievable transformation happen and believed and came to see and be at the feet worshiping Jesus. Here's what I wanna ask you today, who are you today? Are you one who rolls your eyes? Maybe someone brought you here and promised you lunch. You're like, I'll go, but this stuff is weird. 
Are you one who mocks? Are you one that hopes that you came in the door today and you are weighed down by burdens and you're hoping that there's good news and you're hoping that Jesus, who he said he is, or are you ones that have seen Jesus move in your life and say, I believe? I would say it this way. I think all of us are all three in some ways. In our faith journey, I think we've all been one of those. For me in my faith journey, I see that play out so perfectly in faith. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of my story I've told before, but I think it matches perfectly with what we're talking about today. When I was in elementary school, I was kind of a troubled kid and my mom decided that when I got to sixth grade, I needed to not be in the smart kid class, but in the troubled kid class. There were two different ones and we all knew it. And the, Mr. Kenny Barr was the teacher in the smart kid class and, and Mr. Ritchie was a disciplinary in the bad kid class. And so my mom put me in Mr. Ritchie's class. Mr. Ritchie was this massive guy. He's like six foot five, 250 pounds. He wore crazy colored suits like canary yellow and red. He had matching shoes and he had Cadillacs to match the color. And he was a force when he walked down the hallway. And we all knew that he was a follower of Jesus because he made it known to everyone. Of course, there was a lot of eye rolling with him. And so I get into that classroom and he tells me, I want you to go home and I want you to ask your mom if you'd be willing to come here or she can give you the okay to come here before class starts to do a Bible study with me in a public school. Never happened today. And so I go home, hey mom, Mr. Ruchi wants me to go to this Bible study. Yeah, do it. No, I think he already talked to her. <laughs> so I go there and I sit down. I'll never forget the first day. I sit down. He's got a bunch of us there. These boys are kind of smelly and weird. And he opens up the Bible. He says, okay. Let's start at the beginning. In the beginning, God created me. He goes in this thing, right? And as he starts teaching us scripture, he starts teaching us what it means to be a man. He starts really teaching us about Jesus. He starts teaching us about faith. Now at that time, I had this mess. I know it's gonna be hard for you to envision, but I had this massive set of hair, like this unbelievable, beautiful. <laughs> it was like a massive fro, you know? And I loved it and I wouldn't let anyone touch it. I wouldn't let anyone cut it. And by the end of that year, I had a profound moment with Jesus and I had a physical transformation and a spiritual transformation. Something entered into me that changed my life. And he was the only one that allowed me to cut my hair because about, he was Baptist, so he's pretty in hard line, but he was like, look, we gotta get rid of that hair. And so, uh, so I was like, yes, anything you need, you know? And so I had this short haircut and I transformed and I had this amazing moment with Jesus and my life was transformed. I gave my life to Christ at the end of that year in a, in a little altar in a Baptist church about four miles from my house where I live right now. And then I got into middle school and high school and moved into being a musician. I just wandered away from Jesus. He, Mr. Richie became a great family friend, but I kind of wandered away. And part of my story is I studied every ism, Sufism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Course in Miracles, just name it. I studied everything. And during that time, Mr. Richie would come over. I would mock him. I'm like, eh, this old man doesn't know anything. Poor guy. He's so locked into this Jesus thing. He's not about the world. He doesn't know. And I would leave books out that would rip his Jesus and he would see them and it would hurt him. I would say, I would scream out the name of Jesus in a, in a room and he, you know, and I would do it on purpose. I just mock him, I'm like, he doesn't know. And then I went on my way. And as I went on my way, I had a lot of issues and a lot of problems and I started losing hope and I wasn't finding real truth that was lasting. I'd find spurts of truth, but I wasn't finding lasting truth. And finally I would find myself here 19 years ago under that exit sign. And boom, Dave Wilson's preaching about the hope of the world. He's preaching about Jesus and something happened. Something entered in, just like Jesus enters in on Palm Sunday, he enters into our heart. And the minute it entered in, something changed. There was a profound hope that I found when I was hopeless. And something started to be rewired. And man, life changed. Now it hasn't been like all this beautiful, like unicorns and rainbows life, but something changed and entered in that's just been this undercurrent of hope and joy. So a few years later, I called Mr. Ritchie and we'd still talk, but he had moved away and he was in Pennsylvania. And I remember calling him, he's an old man at that point. And I called him and I said, uh, he goes, hello. And I said, hello, Mr. Ritchie, it's Danny. He goes, what? Mr. Ritchie, it's Danny. He goes, who? I'm not kidding you, it's like a bad movie. Mr. Ritchie, it's Danny Cox. And he's like, oh my gosh, Danny. It's so good to hear your voice. Oh, it's so good to hear you. How are you? And I couldn't barely get the words out. I'm like, Mr. Richie, remember when you told me about Jesus? I go, oh my gosh, you were right. 
And I just started weeping on the other end of the phone. And I remember hearing him as an 86, 87-year-old man just crying. There's a sound to an old man when they weep like that. I'll never forget that interaction. And he said this to me afterwards. He said, Danny, I've been praying for you ever since sixth grade. There are those who roll their eyes and mock at the name of Jesus. There are those in this room right now that desperately hope that what he claimed is true. And there are those that have found that what he said was true. I would say to you today this, I fully believe the claims of Jesus. Not only because I've experienced it in my own life, my family's life, in this community's life, but I believe it in terms of investigating Jesus and the claims of Jesus and the writings about Jesus and the way Jesus is moving through communities, moving through generations, moving through eternity. And it's interesting to me that even Jesus' closest followers doubted Even after Jesus resurrected and showed himself to his disciples, he had his close disciple Thomas. We get the we get the whole phrase doubting Thomas. Thomas didn't believe, and he's looking at Jesus. And you know what Jesus said to him? It's okay. You know what he said to do? Here and just investigate me. Search me. Touch me. Let's go. Touch the scars on my hands. Go ahead, Thomas, it's okay. Here's what I want to say to you this Easter week. Would you investigate Jesus? Don't just go through this week and say, ah, it's Easter week, great. We'll dress up, we'll put some bunny ears on and we'll go home. Here's how to ask you this from Palm Sunday to Good Friday when Jesus said, listen, Jesus was betrayed just a few days after this beautiful entry into the city by one of his best friends and followers. And he, he gets falsely accused, he gets arrested, he gets put on trial, he gets convicted, he gets tortured, he gets put to death. Nancy said it well, if you wanna know how deeply you're loved, come back on Good Friday. Be reminded of what a real sacrifice looks like, not just for you, but for all people. And then just a couple of days later, Jesus would overcome, ultimately overcome death. And that anyone that would place their faith in Jesus Christ would never perish, but have eternal life. Jesus did not come to condemn, but to save. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. That's what I think this week is about. It's about hope in the midst of a human experience. It's about the truth of the claims of Jesus. It's about the movement of Jesus and the eternal made in the image of God, parts of every human being that speak to each other in the name of Jesus. It's about true life. That's the claims of Easter. And I invite you to investigate Jesus. Search him, investigate him, believe in him. Let me pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this community. Thank you for the honesty on that wall of this community. Thank you, Lord, that you are in the midst of all things, that you are in the midst of our suffering. We follow a suffering savior for a reason because the Greek gods were so distant, they they would only come down to show their power. But Lord, you decided to come vulnerable with a mission of sacrifice into a wooden stable, into a part, probably a part of a mountain cut out into this little cave and this wooden little manger. Father, you'd wash your disciples' feet. You would put your power down. You would lay your life down. You would ride into the city, not giving the people what they want and what they expected, but something so much more. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for this season. Father, would you do an awakening in our community? Would you birth another level of faith and hope rooted in Jesus? And would you let us walk through this week thinking of you, investigating of you, talking to you, praying with you? Father, I do pray for a radical movement of Jesus. You are the hope of glory. You are the hope of the world. We're grateful. Amen. We're getting ready to to sing together. And I'm gonna invite everyone who is able to stand, to stand. We're gonna sing a song that's that's real simple to start, that simply says, I exalt thee. Exalt is a word that we probably don't use too much around here, but it simply means to give place or to elevate something to a higher position of power.
power. And definitely on Palm Sunday, when Jesus rode into the town of Jerusalem, that's exactly what scripture tells us they did. They were singing his praises and screaming out, Hosanna, Hosanna, exalting his name on high. So as we celebrate the arrival of this triumphant king, we're going to lift our voices and literally just say together as a community, we exalt thee. Can we do that together? So it's simple. It goes like this. I exalt thee. Because you are a redeemer, you are our savior, and God, you loved us so deeply that you sent your son to the cross to suffer a death so horrific, just so that we may have the hope and the opportunity to come to know you. Lord, we love you and we thank you for Jesus, and together we say amen. We're going to sing one more song together. That simply says that he came. Just like he said he would come, he came. 
right? And because he came, we now have hope through his resurrection power. Is anyone excited about that? So Tori's going to lead us in it.
I cannot tell you how many miracles I've seen happen in this community. Sometimes we have this image of a miracle that it has to be this extravagant thing. And sometimes that does happen. I've seen that as well. But the miracle to me is when you have someone that's hopeless and they find hope. I just had a moment down there with someone uh, come off the stage and boom, just weeping, saying, I was hopeless walking in today, but something told me to come. And, and just absolute tears streaming down saying, I, thank you. What is it saying? It's not thank you for me. My words don't mean anything. They mean nothing. Far from Jesus, nothing. But the hope in Jesus, I'm telling you, it brings life and flourishing. That is the miracle. And that is Easter. It's so funny to me. I, we have, when you leave today, you're gonna get, you can grab palms and everything. I'm down there, I'm sitting there playing drums with these. I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't help it, you know? But when you leave today, grab these. And remember this moment. Remember the hope found in Jesus. When you also leave, you're going to get invites uh, to, to Easter. We'd love you to grab some of them, give them to your friend, bring them back because the Easter really is going to be talking about the hope and the power and the love of Jesus. How can we not talk about that? Also, that wall, uh, I really do uh, encourage you. If you want to write something, great. But if you want to read something, I, I really would love you to read that and hear the cries of our, of our people. If you need prayer, come down front. Uh, prayer out in the lobby to all. And you're brand new. Just go out to the hub. We'd love to shake your hand and hear your story. But we'll come back. I'll see you on Good Friday. Have a great rest of your week.